A long time ago in the garden green Everything was perfect like a dream Together with God walked a man and wife Totally dependent on the author of life And all they had to do was just obey And paradise was theirs forever and a day Just obey That's all Well, into the garden slithered the snake With deception in his mouth and souls to take And through his lies the first couple fell down And their eyes were partly open but they lost their crown And the thunder clapped and the judgment fell As the fires of heaven lit the flames of hell Judgment fell Centuries passed under death's firm hold Fear of growing masters since so bold Until the God of heaven sent his only son To break the serpent's grip and make him run Go on, get out of here, Satan Because the second Adam's blood was the price well paid So the glory of the cross will never fade Price well paid. Yeah! Listen, this is your part. Well, the devil still roars, but he's lost his teeth. So we must still resist him through belief. So with the armor of God upon my frame, I will stand my ground. Will you do the same? Because we're on our way back to paradise. So the enemies defeated not once, but twice. On our way back to paradise. Whoa. Not once, but twice On our way back To paradise Yeah, that's where I'm going I'm not done yet Work with me, people Time ago in a garden green, everything was perfect like a dream. You know, in a previous life, I actually was a musician. I recorded five CDs in Italy. One is in English. And they're available out of guest services if you promise not to laugh at the picture that was taken 25 years ago of me. If you like the music, buy it for yourself. If you don't, buy it for an enemy. <laughs> and by the way, please uh, vote as we call our CFO, um, business administrator. I don't know if you caught it this week, but there was uh, an eclipse of the sun.
Did you catch it? Did you notice it? The media didn't say much about it. <laughs> but I did what any vaccinated adult would do. Around 10 o'clock in the morning, I went outside only to find the entire staff of Creekside Christian Church was already outside <laughs> looking up at the sun. And I quickly looked up at the sun and discovered there probably was a better solution than staring at the sun. That was not a sustainable solution. And lucky for me, someone had given me my eclipse shades that I had ready to go. And there's actually two gears to these things. I don't work inside. But uh, with these shades, I was able to see something different. <laughs> All right? And what I saw was an 86% eclipse of the sun. How many of you saw this? Now, how many of you bought the shades that actually have two lenses on them so that you could actually, after seeing the eclipse, you could see the face of the moon? Oh, I was the only one? Because this is what I saw after that. I, <laughs> I just put that second shade down and I'm just messing with you. I'm just kidding. Okay. All right. Work with me, people. Work with me. My point, actually, in the middle of that lie is, is that... Uh, it's interesting that how the lens that we bring to any circumstance determines what we do or don't see. And so my question to you this morning is, what lens do you bring to spiritual matters to try to understand what's happening around you in the invisible, uh, in the invisible stuff that's going on every day? And last week what we did was we began a great series of messages called Forward to Freedom, Spiritual Warfare, and we got things rolling with the presentation of three different lenses or three different worldviews for evaluating and living in the reality around us. Because we all have a worldview, whether we realize it or not, and we defined worldview last week as the general thought system that we develop for explaining the world around us and our experiences in it. And it's kind of absorbed subconsciously, so you don't even think you have one, but you all have one, because you have to interpret the world you live in, and you have to try to figure out how to do okay in this world. And quite frankly, we can come up with some conclusions in our interpretation that are very faulty, and if our conclusions or observations are not based on what God says, it's gonna lead to behavior that is out of bounds with God as well. So what I want to do is I just want to go back over two worldviews that were presented last week and then kind of build a biblical worldview. And inside your, your programs this morning, we, we made a, a blue insert so that you can kind of follow that along and, and I wanted to make sure you had a permanent copy of some of this stuff so you could understand it better. And we started with the Western or the secular worldview. This is uh, the dominant worldview of Europe and North America. And in this worldview, uh, it essentially, uh, the day, on a daily basis, let me, let me back up because I was reading the wrong notes. The approach to interpreting reality tends to divide its concepts of reality into two entirely separate spheres, the religious sphere and the scientific sphere, the realm of religion, faith, the supernatural, ghosts, mysticism, the place where God lives, if you believe in God, right? I mean, a lot of people in the West now have rejected even the existence of God. And then there's the realm of science, the natural world, the, the realm of the mind, human knowledge, things we can see and touch and verify scientifically. We call this often the real world, though I would propose that the entire reality of what's going on around us, invisible or visible, is the real world. But in the Western worldview, there's this big excluded middle where if you can't see it or touch it, it must not exist. So there's no real room in the Western mindset for beings like angels or demons or the Holy Spirit or the interactive work of God in our life because the two categories are so separated. And that's what you call secularism. That's what you call the Western worldview. Let me move now to the animistic worldview, which is shared by about two-thirds of the human race, which, by the way, lives and operates on a daily basis, believing that spiritual forces are an everyday reality, and the line between the supernatural realm and the natural realm is very porous, and there's an awful lot of things going on. Uh, anthropologists have studied all kinds of tribes under the sun, and this should not be a surprise to us, though it is to people that reject God, that even in the remotest tribes, in the Amazon jungle, they consistently find some kind of a belief in a creator God, just as the Bible presents a creator God. 
But for animistic people, that particular creator God doesn't have as much influence on daily lives as other spiritual powers that are in their presence, which are loosely defined as mana. Okay, that's not mana, bread from the sky. It's, it's spiritual powers that either reside in impersonal objects like Star Wars, the force be with you, or a rock formation, or a, a waterfall, or special rivers, or ominous weather conditions, omens, sacred animals like a Brahmin bull in India. Or this power might reside in personal entities like dead relatives, and that's why people sometimes worship ancestors, or they try to placate or pacify good or evil spirits. And this, this worldview, by the way, is very, very present in Disney films like The Lion King and the recent film Moana, as I mentioned before. But uh, there's constant interactions in this animistic worldview between the supernatural realm and the natural realm. And that's why, just as the church has te teachers and pastors to try to help us work through uh, spiritual issues, so do animistic people. They have what they call experts that are good at manipulating or interpreting signs or balancing spiritual powers in the favor of the people that come and seek their help, generally paying for that service as well. We call these people witches. We call these people shamans, witch doctors, mediums, spiritists, fortune tellers, uh, palm readers, etc., etc., that are supposedly good at interpreting signs as well as placating, appeasing, or manipulating the spiritual balance of power in the favor of those that seek their help. And again, going back to those famous Disney films, Rafiki, uh, that baboon was a shaman or a witch doctor that was manipulating the spirits and talking with Simba's ancestors to try to figure out a way forward for him. And in the more recent film, Tala, the, the grandmother of Moana, was actually a spiritist who, who channeled spirits and then actually reincarnated back into a man of war to sister granddaughter towards the end of the movie. I mean, it's just straight up animism, guys. Straight up animism. Here in America, if you share the animistic worldview and your child gets sick, you're going to take that child to somebody that would manipulate powers like a witch doctor or a shaman rather than a medical professional. If you live in the Western world, you'd do the exact opposite. You'd quickly run to the hospital, the doctors, or some pill, and that's why America is the most medicated people on earth. Neither view is correct. But I gotta say, the animistic view gets a little closer to reality because at least it recognizes the presence of evil and evil spirits, whereas the Western worldview does not. But both of them have major gaps that lead to faulty beliefs and faulty behavior. How'd you like to live your whole life misinterpreting the reality around you? So once again, I ask you the question, through what lens, or wherever that, those happy lenses went, through what lens do you evaluate reality around you? What do you use to try to understand it? How do we correctly understand and relate to the world around us? This was the last question of the message last week. And the answer is very, very clear. There are certain spiritual realities that only God can tell us about because the naked eye can't see them. And if he doesn't give us this information, we would not have it. So the answer is we seek this information through revelation. We seek it through the word of God. And I want to warn you. This book tells you that there is a constant spiritual battle going on all the time around you, and you must engage or lose. There are no other options. It's ominous, a little spooky at times. So let me see if I can't begin to help you develop a biblical world view so that you can so that you can kind of interpret what's happening a little better, okay? Let me first of all say that throughout the Bible, we read about a heavenly order of beings called angels. You don't hear much about this in school, but I was just thinking, you remember it's a wonderful wi uh, life with a, a wonderful wife. I'm thinking of my wife, Michelle. It's a wonderful life. You remember that with Jimmy Stewart? Remember the, uh, Clarence the angel? It used to be back in the 40s that America had more of a worldview like this than we do today. Now we have spirit guides for our children in school. But what's interesting to me is, is that angels are presented from the 16th chapter of Genesis to the last chapter of the Bible. The Bible is replete with angels and angelic activity, 290 references in the Bible to this. So it is crystal clear 
that there are angels in God's cosmology. And we don't talk much about that in America. But the bigger question is, well, what about Satan and demons? Did God make evil? I don't think I'd try to put evil at God's doorstep. What God did was he made angels, and a portion of those angels chose to exercise their will to revolt against God. And that's where evil comes into the world and where it comes in to the universe. But I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 14. Because we get some critical information in the Bible from God about where this whole realm of darkness starts. Now I want you to understand, as you turn here, this is a section of the book of Isaiah where God judges the nations that had hammered Israel. And in the midst of this, he's judging Babylon. And Babylon was probably the most demonic power of the ancient world. That the, it was just an empire full of the occultic practices. Read the book of Daniel, for example. Uh, but what's interesting is in Isaiah chapter 14, at a certain point, God sort of switches gears and stops addressing Babylon and goes directly to the spirit that's inspiring the development of the Babylonians, which is the devil himself. And you'll see this when you see his language, because all of a sudden, it's very clear God is talking with Satan. And this is what he says. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star. By the way, star is often a reference to angels in the Bible. Son of the dawn. The Latin word for son of the dawn is Lucifer. That's where we get his name. Lucifer, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to earth. So where's the devil now? He's in Elk Grove. You who once laid low the nations, you said in your heart, now watch this, five times he says it, I, 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 I. You should always be fearful of people that always talk in the I, 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 I tense. He said in his heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit in throne of the Mount of Assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the cloud. I will make myself like the most high. You've got a being that wants to take the place of God and steal his glory. Whoa, I think you call that pride. I think you also call it stupidity, but it's pride. But God says, you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. Do you see how that's bigger than just Babylon here, folks? He's talking with a spiritual being. Now turn two prophets over to Ezekiel chapter 28. Just double the number 14 and go to 28, but in the book of Ezekiel. Because once again, God gives you very, very critical information about the realm of darkness. And in Ezekiel chapter 28, beginning at about the second half of verse 12. Once again, God speaking to Tyre, who by the way was like the ancient United States, the best in merchandising, but willing to, to, to trample its own people and destroy people in the process. And this is what God says. He speaks to the spirit behind Tyre. He's talking to the devil again. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Can you stop for just a second? Um, you know that image that we have of devils being dressed in red, really ugly, pitchfork, fork tail and all that? Devils aren't ugly people. Devils are beautiful. And their temptation is enticing. I've never been tempted to lust at a woman that was 85 years old. The devil sends you enticing temptations. You were perfect in beauty. You were in Eden. The Garden of God. Who was in the Garden of Eden? Adam, Eve, and Satan. Oh. Every precious stone adorned you. Once again, speaking of his beauty on the day you were created, that they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub. Somehow Satan was very, very close to the throne of God and had a very, very significant role there. For so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones, speaking of the throne area of God. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Somewhere along the line, Satan sinned. That sin was pride. So I threw you to the earth. Are you seeing this? And then you go into the Gospels and you see things like Luke chapter 10, verse 18. And if you don't have this context, you might miss it. But Jesus says the same thing. I saw Satan 
fall like lightning from heaven. Remember, Jesus is eternal. He saw it happen. He saw it happen. I want you to turn now in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 12, the last book of the Bible. It should be the last book of the Bible is not index. Last book of the Bible is Revelation chapter 12, which once again gives you critical information. It starts with this vision of this woman that's clothed with the sun and, and standing on a moon, and she's got 12 stars on her head. She's pregnant, about to give birth. It speaks of Israel about to give birth to the Messiah. Then the second vision is of a great red dragon. Pick it up at verse 3, and we'll read about that dragon. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. Notice this detail. His tail swept a third of the stars, a reference to angels, out of the sky and flung them to the what? To the earth. So Satan in his rebellion took a third of the angelic order with him. Are you with me, people? Verse 7 says, and there was war in heaven. Because Satan's getting, he's getting kicked out. Verse 7, and there was war in heaven. Michael, the archangel of God, and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. So even Satan has an army of angel, angelic beings that will fight for him. But he was not strong enough, meaning Satan and his fallen angels. And they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him, a third of the angelic order, was thrown out of heaven. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, look at the screen, this is interesting, rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to you, earth and sea, because the devil has gone down to you and is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. So the heavens, they're happy because evil was cast out. But where did the evil go? To earth. To earth. And so it's woe to you, earth. Because have you ever seen a very powerful being that knows that he's going down and how crazy he can be when the ship's going down? Look at North Korea, people. It's not even hard to imagine this. Satan's going to do as much damage, even though he's a condemned foe, that he can before he gets thrown into the lake of fire. And by the way, if Satan ever reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. All right? The lake of fire. All right. So uh, I, uh, with, with this in mind, I want you to think in terms of the Garden of Eden, because when when he was cast out of heaven, where did he go? The earth. Where's the next time you see him? In the Garden of Eden, tempting the first human beings. And so God speaks prophetically as he led this couple to fall, saying, I'll put hostility, warfare, enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, the seed of the woman being the Messiah, the virgin birth Messiah, right? And he, the Messiah, will crush your head, but you're going to strike his heel. So there's this warfare until, right, it's over. That's what this is depicting here. Now, with that in mind, we can begin to build a pretty cool worldview. So let me just attempt that, okay? The first drawing that you have about a biblical worldview needs to not only acknowledge a divine sphere and a human sphere, but you need to acknowledge also in the middle an angelic sphere. And we need to understand that angels are fixed in number. Okay, we'll hear about that in just a second. There's a lot of them, but they're fixed in number. And, and two-thirds of the angels are good angels that are confirmed in their righteousness that serve God and do his bidding. And a third of the angels followed Satan in his rebellion and were cast out of heaven, okay? This is the beginning of developing a biblical worldview. Are you with me so far? Now, when you start to read the Bible, things start to make sense. You run into things like Psalm 8 that says, Oh, Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And then in verse 4 it says, And what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care about him? You made him a little lower than the angels. The sphere of God, the sphere of angels, the sphere of humans. But somewhere along the line, God has to do something for some human beings that give them spiritual authority over angels, so he has to lift us up above the angels. Be paying attention, because we get verses like Romans 16 that say things like this, to the church, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet, which means that we are somehow moved above the angels, particularly the fallen angels. 
Stay with me. Are you with me? Okay, this is important. So let me divert and let's have a little fun. Let's, let's do some ABCs about good angels before we talk about the bad ones, okay? And let me give you a few myths that we just need to debunk because there's a lot of things people think about angels that are wrong. Myth number one is everyone, every, whoa, back up, back up. Whoa, hey, we're really happy here. Everyone has a guardian angel, okay? Understand, first of all, angels are fixed in number, but human beings continue to procreate and grow in number. You can't possibly make that work. There are myriads and myriads of angels, but there are almost eight billion people on planet earth. So I don't find anywhere in scripture that says every single human being has a guardian angel. Okay, I know the angels protect human beings, and I know a whole bunch of them must have protected our kids when they were little, but I can't show you a scripture that says every single person has a guardian angel. So let's be a little careful with that one, okay? Number two, angels marry and reproduce. I hate to break your bubble, burst your bubble, but there are no such thing as baby angels, okay? I know you've seen the little cards with the little baby cherubs that are naked and cute and all that, but it's a lie, okay? Angels do not marry. They are not given in marriage. They do not procreate. Jesus was asked about the resurrection in Matthew 22, verse 30, and he said at the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. So he's speaking about in the next life, neither will we marry and be given in marriage and have children. He said, but we will be like the angels in heaven, not the same as angels, but we will neither marry nor reproduce, okay? No baby angels, no angel marriage. And then the third myth I want to debunk is, is that people become angels after death. This, I hear this at funerals sometimes with little children, when little children die, that uh, so-and-so became one of God's angels. And I think it's a cute sentiment, sentiment, but it's not true. Because the angelic order and the human order are forever different. And the Bible even tells us that angels are curious to look in on human experience, particularly redemption, because no angel has ever experienced redemption. They're just good angels and condemned angels. But there's no angels that fell and they were saved. And so uh, in the kingdom to come, human beings will have regular communication with good angels, but we will forever be separate orders, human and angels. It won't be a problem for God. We'll have fun with it. It's okay. But we won't ever be an angel. Okay? Uh, let me talk to you about some of important facts about angels. If you're ready to fill in the blanks, this might help, okay? First of all, uh, the Bible makes it clear in Psalm 148, I think I put a reference in your outline, I hope I did, that angels are created by God. And John 1 says, everything was created through Christ. So angels are created by God through Christ. Christ is eternal, angels have a beginning. Second of all, uh, I, I want to say that the angels have incredible privileges, first among them, is that they dwell in the immediate presence of God before God's throne. Now, you might think, uh, okay, but do you understand, if you actually dwell before the living God, you don't need faith. You have sight. They see God. Is that, there's no one going, I wonder if he exists. Are you kidding they see him and do his bidding. What an awesome privilege to be in the very presence of God. Now, the Bible tells us the trinity of virtues are faith, hope, and love. Do you realize that in heaven, neither faith or hope are necessary? Only love remains because you don't have to have faith in what you see, and you don't have to hope for eternity when you've got it. The only thing left is, is love, and that's what the angels have. They are in the immediate presence. of What a privilege. And I want to talk to you a little bit about their attributes because it's important for us to understand what they are and what they're not. And I'll start by saying the first attribute is, is that they're endless in existence. In other words, they have a beginning, but they have no end. They're never going to die. They're never going to cease to exist. And by the way, angels don't age either. What a cool thought, huh? Neither will glorified bodies age in the next life. And I, I hear they're going to carve off a few pounds on our way up too. Um, <laughs> Uh, second thing I want you to know is that there's an, they are established in order. There's a hierarchy among angels, both good and evil. You've got archangels, you've got powers, dominions, authorities mentioned in Ephesians 6, 12. You've got like this very well-organized army. There's a hierarchy among the angelic order. 
Thirdly, their individual and personality. They have names. You've got the name, the archangel of Israel is Michael or Mikael. They have also Gabriel, who was a messenger angel that visited Zechariah and visited Mary. You've got the angel that talked with, uh, the angel of the Lord that talked with Zechariah and another angel that talked with John in the apocalypse. So you've got these different angels with different identities and they're also very intelligent. And you never hear some angel showing up going, oh, what was I supposed to tell you? You know, just... They're just all very articulate. And might I add, don't ever try to do an intellectual arm wrestling contest with an angel because they're not only smarter than you, they've been around a lot longer than you and figured out a lot of stuff you can't figure out in 80 years. So you don't defeat angels through human intellect. Uh, They rapidly travel. Uh, you know, they can go from heaven to earth so quick and they don't need BART, they don't need, you know, a Tesla, they don't, they don't need a rocket, they don't need an elevator, they just... And it's like they also enjoy another dimension of reality too because I don't even know where you'd go to get to heaven. I mean, it seems to me it's in a different dimension, but they rapidly travel. Also, the Bible makes it clear they're able to appear and disappear at will. Think of uh, the nativity and the angel of the Lord that all of a sudden appeared to the shepherds in Luke 2, and then a whole angelic choir appeared to them, and then the whole group disappeared to them. It's because they can appear and disappear at will. And by the way, when angels appear, the normal human response is terror. That's why the most common angelic command is stop being afraid, because if you see an angel, you'll be afraid. This guy that calls on a talk radio. He says, I was shaving this morning and I saw an angel. He said, okay, well, my next question would be, what did you do? Because if you kept on shaving, it wasn't an angel. You'd fall on your face and freak out. That's what you'd do. Could you imagine an angel showing up while you're getting ready to start your day? You'd remember that. They're powerful. We're told at the resurrection of Christ that one angel came down from heaven and actually just pushed the stone away from the mouth of the grave and then sat on it and said, hi. (laughs) That last part I made up, but a whole group of people couldn't do that. These are powerful beings, man. Now, you might start trying you might be tempted to think they're like God. No, they're not. They have limitations, okay? For example, they're not omnipotent. They can't do everything. Only God can do all things. They're not omniscient. They don't know all things. They're not omnipresent. They're not everywhere at the same time. Those are attributes of God. So angels have their limitations. Now I want to talk to you about their responsibilities. And by the way, uh, you need to be in a life group to have the full measure of this because I can't go into all of it. But as a general rule, The Bible calls angels ministering spirits. I'm going to show you my favorite verse about angels, and then I'm going to just briefly give you a list of stuff angels do, but it's our life groups that are going to dig into this starting today. So if you're not in a life group, go out and sign up for one, because this is a great opportunity to meet a bunch of friends and talk about spiritual warfare and learn more. But here's Hebrews 1.14. I don't know if you've ever caught this before. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Pay very careful attention. The context is Jesus is superior to angels in Hebrews 1. But what we have in this last verse of Hebrews is information about how God sends angels as ministering spirits, particularly for his people. But if you pay careful attention, it's a little more than that. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve or assist those who will inherit salvation? This indicates that the angels not only assist the redeemed, they assist the elect who will be redeemed in the future. And only God knows who they are. That means angels protected me before I was converted at 18 so that Satan couldn't kill me before I became a child of God. I hope that encourages your bones. Oh, the depths and the riches of the wisdom of God. How unsearchable, how unfathomable his ways. You have a great God. There is no being that could ever be more perfect and beautiful than the God of the Bible. 
So what do they do? Uh, our life groups are going to go through all the verses that talk about this. They're in the questions of the life groups if you can't make it, but they help reveal truth that God has given them to reveal to people. They guide people like they guided Joseph to get out of Bethlehem before Herod came to kill the babies. They provide even food for people. I don't know if it's angel food cake or something, but they provide it. They, they protect people. They deliver people like they delivered uh, Peter from prison in Acts chapter 12. They strengthen. They encourage people. Daniel could even breathe until an angel touched him. Their agents have answered prayer. They're sent when we pray. God sends angels to answer those prayers. They separate the righteous and the evil at judgment day, and they escort the redeemed to eternity. There's all kinds of stuff that angels do, and only our life groups will know for sure. Okay, uh, you get the point, all right? I'm trying to create some holy jealousy. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2, though, okay? Ephesians chapter 2, because I want to give the final touches for our biblical worldview and then draw one more diagram for you and then we're done, okay? In Ephesians chapter two, we read these words. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So this verse, let me just put it in real simple language. Before conversion, you were dead spiritually in your sins and your transgressions, and you were under the power and influence and control of the devil. That's what this verse means. And most of us didn't even know it. That's how good the devil's work was in our life. And then we pick up verse 2 that says, uh, I'm sorry, verse 3 that says, all of us also lived among them, uh, those that were lost, at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. And like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath, because to be outside of Christ is to be an object of wrath. It's to be a person destined to hell. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, speaking to believers, even when we were dead in transgressions, he gave us a spiritual resurrection through faith. It is by grace you have been saved. And notice verse 6, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Where are believers seated right now? Did you catch verse 6? God actually gave us a new position as we trust in Christ. And where Christ is, that's where God considers us. So Christians are over the angels in the heavenly realms. Did you catch that? Now I can give you a biblical cosmology. Now we can talk about a true biblical worldview. Okay? First of all, there's the divine sphere and the human sphere, but there's an angelic sphere in between them, right? And in order for us to understand a biblical worldview, we need to understand that... God the Son left the divine sphere and came down through the angelic sphere. That's why Satan's often called the God of the air. He came through his realm into the human sphere and incarnated as a human baby, lived a perfect life, laid his life down, bleeding on a cross to buy back rebel humans. And then he raised from the dead and then he ascended right back through the demonic realm and he is now seated at the right hand of God. And when Christians trust in Christ, we do the same thing positionally. We go right through the devil's territory and we're seated above them in Christ in the heavenly realms. Whoa! That's awesome! We're going to talk about that two weeks from now, okay? So don't even, th don't, you didn't even hear me say that, okay? So think about this. When it comes to Christ being seated in the heavenly realms and us in Christ, that's a pretty good position, right? So let's talk about believers here. So believers, we're told that believers have Christ in our life, and so we're here, but we're seated in the heavenly realms. We have the assistance of angels, ministering spirits, right? We just talked about that. We also have the ongoing ministry of the Holy Spirit that leads us into truth, convicts, comforts, uh, brings to memory scripture, things like that. Wow, we got a lot of resources, but we're also attacked by fallen angels or the devil. 
all right, who seeks to accuse us and lie to us and deceive us and tempt us. He attacks us. But we're given heavenly resources like the armor of God, like the truth of God, like the word of God, like prayer, fasting, so that we can submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from us, James 4, 7. You start to see there's a battle going on, but we got all the resources we need. We got angels on our side. We got the Holy Spirit on our side. We got God's resources on our side. But what about non-believers? I didn't know Christ until I was 18 years old. What about me? Pre-18. Well, the Bible doesn't have good news there. The Bible tells us that everybody that is not in Christ is under the devil's power. And I want you to hear me carefully this morning. Because I remember the first time I heard this, I was a little overwhelmed. Because it was like the veil was removed from my eyes and I realized I thought I was a clever fellow and I was duped. And the devil had owned me for 18 long years. And it was over. Because through his lies, through his deceit, through his attacks, he controlled my life. He deceived me into thinking I was spiritually fine. My advice to you, if you're not a Christian this morning, is flee to Christ. Trust Christ. Receive Christ. He gives you terms of peace that are outstanding, and you stand no chance in this spiritual battle without Christ and his resources. In fact, at the end of the service, we'll have friends here by the stage. They'd be happy to pray with you. Just come and say, I need Christ in my life. They'll help you pray to receive Christ into your life. You need to turn to Jesus Christ. First John 5.19 says, the whole world lies under the devil. And when I was 18 years old, I moved out of the devil's camp. I trusted Christ, and now I'm seated in the heavenly realms of Christ with all of the resources needed to not only survive in this battle, but to win it. I'm in it to win it, people. So let me wrap this thing up, okay? Let's be real clear on our context, okay? Who are the main contestants in this spiritual warfare? Some people say, well, Satan and people. No. No, no, uh, it's bigger than that. Humans are more like the pawns in this game, okay? The real contestants are the infinite, uncreated, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God, plus the holy angels, which are two-thirds of the angels, okay? Contestant number one, God. I mean, so the game's already over, right? And then the other contestant is Satan, a finite, created, limited, on a leash, fallen, condemned angel, plus demons or fallen angels, which represent one-third of the angelic order, which is a fixed number, right? So it's no contest. It's already over. In fact, the war is already over, but there's a lot of cleanup battles, and we're losing way too many of them. And where's the stage where this is all playing out? Where is it taking place? Satan got cast out of heaven, and where was he cast to? Elk Grove. Come on, let's get real, people. It's in your home. It's every time you turn on the television. It's every time you go to work. That's where it is. It's earth. And you can say, oh, I don't believe it. Well, stop believing in oxygen. Then you don't breathe, I guess. I don't know. It is happening. It's, it's like, well, I don't believe in hell. That doesn't change the temperature of hell one degree. Whether you believe in it or not. If it's true, it's true. And what's the trophy? What would they get out of it? Okay? This is a good question. Because both Satan and God want something, and only God deserves it, and it's glory. Okay? And, and God or Satan are most glorified as people follow them and submit to their will. But I want to read to you some verses. This is God speaking in Exodus 14. I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue the Israelites and I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. Habakkuk 2.14 And the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Isaiah 42.8 I am the Lord that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another. It's mine. You know how we end the Lord's Prayer? Until I be the 
glory. Satan wants it, but he doesn't deserve it. He's a fallen being. Remember? I, 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 I. That's why he was kicked out. He's just a, he's a created being, and yet he wanted the glory of being in charge of all creation. So God had to cast him out because it was jealousy and pride in his heart. But there is one thing that God wants besides this. Satan doesn't really want it. Some people say Satan wants people. He just loves people and wants them all to be in hell with him. Satan doesn't love you. He wants to eat you for lunch. But God does love you. And shock of all shocks, you're made in his image. And he wants to be with you forever. And out of the overflow of his life, he just wants to keep leaking on you. Satan wants to suck your life, and God wants to give you more life. I was reading at midnight the screw tape letters. I wouldn't recommend that. It's a C.S. Lewis book about a conversation between demons. Couldn't sleep last night. Got up, and I read this. Understand that these are two demons talking to each other, so every time they say enemy, that means God, and every time they say our leader, it means Satan. But I want you to hear this out, because this is, I read this at midnight last night. This is two demons talking to us. A human is primarily food. Our aim is the absorption of its will into ours, the increase of our own area of selfhood at the human's expense. But the obedience which the enemy, God, demands of men is quite a different thing. One must face the fact that all the talk about God's love for men and his service of being perfect freedom is not as one would gladly believe, mere propaganda, but an appalling truth. He, God, really does want to fill the universe with a lot of loathsome little replicas like himself. Creatures whose life on its miniature scale will be qualitatively like his own. Not because he, God, has absorbed them, but because their wills freely conform to his. We, Satan and devils, want cattle whom we can finally, who can finally become food. He wants servants who can finally become sons. We want to suck in. He, God, wants to give out. We, devils, are empty and would be filled. He is full and flows over. Our war aim is a world in which our father below, Satan, has drawn all other beings into himself. The enemy, God, wants a world full of beings united to him but still distinct. The goals are totally different. And let me remind you, God has such a great future for his kids. Receive his love. Respond to his love. This is a great cosmic battle. But once again, I just have to repeat, God's terms of peace are off the charts great. Forgiveness, canceling all past evil deeds, filling us with divine resources if we would turn in humility and repent and trust Christ we can become the children of the living God, seated in the heavenly realms above the angelic order. I'm getting hungry. We got to (laughs) quit. But we're going to call our ushers now. We're going to receive our morning offering. Next week, we're going to talk about unmasking the adversary. And then after that, we're going to talk about authority. No, 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 no. Let's call our worship team back. And as they come, let me pray. Our Father, we are so grateful that you have come to give us life and give it in abundance. God, I thank you for your word that gives us so much information about this spiritual battle. I thank you for your Holy Spirit that leads us into truth and your ministering angels that are sent to assist us and the the weapons for warfare, the, the, the armor of God and your constant presence in our life. Lord, I would pray that you open the eyes of our heart that we might see or at least understand what's going on and that we would stand firm, submit to God, resist the devil, devil, and then you'd make him flee from us. God, we love you. We thank you for all you provided for us. We thank you for your ongoing presence and power in our life. And we commit ourselves to you. Lord, if there are people today that don't know you in my hearing, May your Holy Spirit draw them like a river is drawn to the sea. And may they not leave this place until they've trusted Christ and decided they're going to stand with the Son of God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.